I'm going to start off by introducing our expert panelists today. We have Dr. Al Steyer. She's an assistant professor and DNP project coordinator at the University of Louisville School of Nursing. Dr. Al Steyer's research focuses on health disparities, health promotion, healthcare access, and cancer prevention and screenings for minority populations. We also have Chris Hartman. Chris Hartman is the, direct, the first director of Kentucky's Fairness Campaign and a steering committee member of the Fairness Co Coalition. Chris has helped pass more than 20 LGBTQ anti-discrimination fairness ordinances in Kentucky communities. And lastly, we have Bridget Pickock. She's a family nurse practitioner at Cal and Lord Community Health Center, New York City's largest healthcare provider to primarily LGBTQ plus people. Bridget recently started their own BP, the Queer NP business, which is an advising and consulting group focused on inclusive and affirming healthcare. So I'm so excited to talk to them today. And we have, uh, we're going to start with a question um, for Dr. Alshire and Bridget. I'm Trevor McGuffin. I'm a, I'm a nurse and I'm a DNP student at the University of Louisville School of Nursing. And I'm on the um, KNA Professional Nursing and Practice and Advocacy Cabinet as a staff nurse. <laughs> All right, so um, first, I just want to ask if you all could talk about barriers to care that LGBTQ individuals face in Kentucky. Well, I'll go ahead and start, although I have to say that um, I hadn't seen the film before. I'd heard about it before, but I had not had the opportunity to actually see it. And uh, I thought it was, um, as you mentioned, just an excellent way of um, helping us from a perspective of those experiencing something to hear their stories. And um, for those of you who know me, you know that I do have some bias because I'm uh, very much um, love translating evidence into practice and qualitative research. So um, I really enjoy when we hear people share their perspectives with us because I think that um, although quantitative data is absolutely essential, finding out those little details sometimes is something that uh, is really important, particularly when we're dealing um, with um, areas um, like barriers to healthcare, because there are many nuances that um, we're really only going to find out sometimes by asking an open-ended question, because if we don't know what response to put um, in the ABCD, we might not get that. And I think one thing that really stood out to me um, in the film that also I have um, found in some of my um, recent research is uh, recently um, I have a study that is finishing up that um, we have interviews for about 30, a, a few over 30 um, sexual and gender minorities in Kentucky um, who have a cervix. So many of them identify as female, but they also included non-binary transmasculine folks related to cervical cancer screening. And really the, if I had to choose one overarching theme, um, when we asked them about barriers and facilitators to cervical cancer screening, this idea of their Invisibility within the healthcare system, uh, heteronormativity, cisnormativity came up very frequently. And it was very interesting that the for this group of individuals in Kentucky, the biggest facilitator was a healthcare provider that they felt comfortable with, had a trusting relationship with. And similarly, some of the biggest barriers were not having that trusted healthcare provider, not having an environment where perhaps they felt comfortable. For example, if they needed to go to um, an office um, where there was a gynecologist for some type of examination specifically, and they had to go into somewhere that was a women's health center when they are transmasculine, and just that um, discomfort, um, and even for some of them, dysphoria that was associated with that. So I think that we could talk um, on and on about the barriers, and I think they are there are many across the socio-ecological socio strata, as we're all aware, but that was just something that stood out to me that um, 
I uh, take very seriously as a healthcare provider myself, because I think it reminds us that we have to ask, but then we have to take responsibility for also um, being part of the problem. And therefore that necessitates us being part of the solutions here, um, because that's what we're being told um, when we ask is, it's the healthcare provider. Yes, there's other factors. I mean, not that once again, um, virtual visits aren't answers or that transportation aren't problems and things, but that those are such key factors in um, healthcare decisions or even feeling comfortable seeking healthcare. So that was one thing that just really stood out to me that I certainly have heard um, our sexual and gender minority uh, community share with our research team recently. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm, I'm Bridget. Um, I completely agree uh, with that. And I think, you know, a huge piece is that lack of, of knowledgeable and competent providers. And for me, I think that really goes back to education. You know, our curriculums are not integrated. Um, you know, our medical school here in Louisville integrated back in 2015, 2016, but most of our nursing schools BSN, um, you know, master's DMP programs are not integrated and not inclusive. And so if we did that, then we could really, people could come out of programs feeling more confident, feeling more comfortable and it not being so, you know, this mystified healthcare, right? When it's really, it's, it's, it shouldn't be, it can be done in primary care. It's just like any other type of healthcare, um, but we've kind of mystified it because we don't talk about it in school. Uh, so I think that is a big piece of that lack of access is um, not, you know, having this in our education systems. And like um, Dr. Alistair said, there's so many, you know, different uh, barriers. A lot of, of folks, especially I, I work in primary care um, and we see patients from all over the country and, and a lot of people are, you know, their primary care providers won't see them. They want to send them to specialists, which for a lot of folks, you know, the documentary touched on people, uh, LGBT folks are usually underinsured or uninsured and, you know, people can't get sent to specialists, right? They can't afford that. Um, and so folks will reach out to friends. They will share hormones. They will share medications, you know? Um, and so having more providers and more people who, you know, treat folks who are uninsured and underinsured, um, I think would really would help with that access as well. I do want to respond to Bridget's comment um, that we are integrating this significantly more um, at the University of Louisville than other schools might be. I don't want to speak for other schools um, or that probably has been done in the past. So I don't you know, know how, how long ago you were connected to a curriculum, but I do wanna say that we are very well aware of the needs and we're very committed to our students learning what they need to learn. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that makes me really happy to hear. I think um, Louisville itself has been, you know, on the front lines of that for many years. Uh, I think as a whole, um, you know, research says the average nursing programs have about anywhere from two to four hours. Um, so of LGBT healthcare. So I'm really glad to know that U of L is is um, making strides with that. That's great. And I don't know that we're necessarily unique. Um, you do need to always realize that any kind of publication is there's a lag, and when it was collected, when it was written, when it was published, and what's going on today. All right, so Chris, um, if you could speak about current legislation in Kentucky that's affecting sexual and gender minorities. Look, uh, the the forecast is grim. I, I don't think that um, I, I have to tell most folks that. If you are on social media, if you read any Kentucky newspapers, if you see any Kentucky news, you've likely heard of at least some of the anti-LGBTQ bills that are moving this year. And, and let me just say, first I should say, I'm sorry, I'm Chris. I use he, him pronouns. I'm executive director of the Fairness Campaign. Uh, I've been at the Fairness Campaign for 14 years and some change. This is my 15th legislative session, and we have never had 
this onslaught of anti-LGBTQ attacks, including several attacks related directly to LGBTQ healthcare. Uh, now we have had several that we've fought over the past few years, but frankly, before last year, we had gone more than a decade without Kentucky passing any explicit anti-LGBTQ bills. Then last year, uh, the Kentucky General Assembly passed a bill that would prohibit trans girls from playing on sports teams in Kentucky schools. And that was after a wave of national anti-trans legislation. Uh, we saw it start in sort of Texas and Florida and then bubble up through the rest of the nation. When we saw West Virginia pass that bill, we sort of knew that we were in trouble. And indeed it happened last year. And so blood in the water, all of a sudden, we've got a dozen anti-LGBTQ bills this year, the vast majority of them targeting the transgender community. Uh, I'm gonna drop in the chat um, a list of all of uh, the bills that we are tracking right now in Kentucky. I think I've dropped it in there correctly. Um, and you'll see first a few good bills, but second, you'll see mostly anti-LGBTQ laws. And there are several in there, but there are three of them that are moving specifically right now. Uh, and one of them has the most uh, egregious healthcare implications. It is House Bill 470. We call it the Omnibus Anti-Trans Bill. Uh, it has changed slightly. So this is the bill that ran through uh, the House Judiciary Committee last week. Mind you, it didn't run through the House Health Committee. I want I want you to note that because the person that runs the House Health Committee is a registered nurse, uh, Republican Representative Kim Mosier, and she understands that gender affirming health care for transgender kids is absolutely necessary and life saving health care, and so she would have never run this anti trans omnibus House Bill 470. Um, and leadership knew that, and so they diverted the bill away from the health committee and sent it to the Judiciary Committee, where it would have a much more favorable chair. And this bill, in its original form, prohibited all forms of gender-affirming health care for trans kids in Kentucky. It prevented all uh, surgery under the age of 18, which first we know does not happen. I mean, very rarely has it happened across the nation, but we know in Kentucky, I, I don't know of anybody that has received any kind of gender affirming surgery under the age of 18. Um, but it mainly prevents access to hormone replacement therapy and all puberty blockers for children under the age of 18, but it goes so much further than that. It prohibits trans youth from being able to change their name legally, so it prohibits the courts from granting legal name changes for trans kids and prevents the Department of Library and Archives from updating trans kids birth certificates if it is for the purpose of transition. The original bill, and this part has been taken out, uh, would also prohibit all forms of mental health care. And this is where a lot of people that signed on to the bill uh, didn't realize how far it went. And so there was some pushback in the majority caucus and the Republican caucus in the Kentucky House. And so the current version of the bill has taken out uh, health care that, or I'm sorry, mental health care that is gender affirming. The original bill would have also forced teachers to monitor their students' gender identity and immediately out them to their parents if any noticeable change occurred in a student's gender identity, uh, which is an absurd requirement of teachers who are supposed to be teaching uh, and not somehow becoming gender police for their trans kids. Um, and so this bill, unfortunately, in its, in its current form, uh, did pass not just the, the House Judiciary Committee, but it passed the Kentucky House of Representatives on the exact same day, last Thursday. And now the Senate leadership is debating the bill, figuring out what they are going to do with the bill. We are very worried about this one. Uh, you'll see another healthcare related bill on there. There are a couple more, but another one that's given us a lot of heartburn through the years is um, House Bill 58, I believe. That's a bill that we fought through the years, uh, mostly in the Senate in a different form. Uh, this bill, fortunately, has not gotten any momentum yet this year, but this bill is so broadly worded that it would allow 
any worker in a healthcare setting to deny service to anyone based on a religious or a philosophical belief. And it has a specific provision in there. Now I'm talking not just your doctors and nurses, we're talking anyone working in a healthcare setting, the person checking you in at the front desk, the person working valet, the folks working in the cafeteria, people uh, cleaning the rooms, all of these folks could refuse to do their job based on any belief that they might have. And if their employer takes any action against them, demotes them, moves them to a different shift, fires them, uh, the person would have the right to sue the employer, typically the hospital or the doctor that employs them. Um, and, you know, this is all part of a nationally coordinated strategy to attack particularly trans youth, uh, but also trans people uh, across the board from accessing gender affirming health care. And again, Kentucky's not the only state facing this type of legislation right now. I'm going to drop into the chat uh, the link where you can send a message if you would like to your state representatives about several of the bills that are moving right now, you can create your own message in there. Um, but I know uh, uh, Trevor's got some more questions for us as we go along, and I'm just grateful uh, to be with you today. Thank you so much, Chris. That's really disheartening to hear, but I'm so happy that you're out there working to make sure that this hopefully does not happen. All right. So back to Dr. Alshire and Bridget. Um, another question we have is, how can nurses improve their LGBTQ cultural competency and what resources exist? Um, I, I'll start with this one. Um, you know, so cultural competency, it implies that um, we as nurses, as MPs, that we can have conversations with our folks. We understand health disparities, um, barriers that people face. Uh, and so, you know, to be able to do that, we have to be asking our patients their sexual orientation and gender identity, which we're not capturing a lot of that data still, um, even though it, we're supposed to be, right? And so if we don't ask those questions, then we're, we're not going to be able to know who, what patients to have those conversations with. We're kind of, it's this invisible piece, right? We're just assuming we're going to treat everybody the same but we can't treat everybody the same, right? We have to treat people the way they need to be treated and everybody needs to be treated a little bit differently. Just like in the documentary, we said, every, every piece of healthcare that somebody encounters should be geared towards them, the individual person. Um, and so, you know, if we don't ask SOGI information, we may not know that one of our youth is, has recently come out and we need to know that um, you know, our LGBT youth, their nine times their suicide risk is nine times that of our straight youth, right? So we need to be talking with them, connecting them to resources, connecting them to mental health care. You know, if we don't have that cultural competency, um, then we're not going to have those conversations. And um, I think one of the, you know, biggest ways is really to educate yourself. Um, there's, there's more data that's coming out every day. There are more papers out there. Um, organizations that I point to people to, GLMA, Health Professionals Advancing LGBT Equality, they have great modules. Um, my favorite is the National LGBT Health Education Center. They provide lots of CEs. Most of it's free. That's when I first um, wanted to educate myself and be more competent. That's where I went. Um, there are different conferences out there, you know, uh, after having um going through some of these modules those are the two places that i really point people to thanks bridget i first of all want to chime back in that um and now i'm gonna misname it trying to say it um but the fenway institute center um that bridget so nicely just said the name of and now i cannot for some reason say it um, that is um, also probably the number one place there is so much information there it's amazing exciting overwhelming kind of all at once if you get on there and start looking um, because they also continue thank you the national lgbt health education center could not be any easier and when i went to say it all of a sudden i could not think of the name. So I um, often recommend that because it really also has 
um, training for many different types of providers, many types levels of knowledge. If you're kind of just wanting a, a beginning overview um, down to if you're wanting something much more in depth, if you are say um, a prescriber for hormones or so there, I really uh, think that it's an excellent resource that really reaches across um, many different types of nurses. I also appreciated Bridget um, giving a definition of cultural competency um, because I struggle a little bit with that word because um, to me it implies that if we're competent at something, if we talk about our nursing competencies as an educator, you know, it's that you have met the bar. And I think we have to realize that we probably are never competent in any type of cultural care. So I, I appreciated that preface of here's kind of what we are meaning when we use that um, word commonly in the literature or talk about it is really that sensitivity, knowledge and awareness related to the health and social needs, for example, of LGBTQ people or of uh, others, and that it really is the patient-centered care. Um, one of the uh, significant findings from um, a study that um, some colleagues and I conducted, I think it was in 2015 or 16, so it's been a little bit now, but it was um, at a major healthcare system um, in Kentucky. We had about 1,500 respondents, um, a thousand of which were nurses. And um, one of the common themes were, I treat everyone the same. And that sounds so good for a moment when you think about delivering the same quality of care to all of your patients. And then when you think about it, um, it becomes disheartening as we think about how everyone needs individualized care that meets them where they are. And so um, there's a quote that I've used many times from that research and it's very simple, but it was a, a quote from the qualitative portion. And the individual said, why does it matter? I treat everyone the same. And that is something I think we all have to be cautious about because it's easy um, for that to sound good, I think, for a moment. Um, but then when we think about it, really, um, as healthcare providers, what we're trying to do is meet the specific needs of each individual. And maybe changing directions just a little bit, if I might, to touch on thinking also about how um, as we look at ourselves and our environment, how can we think about improving our care? Um, I would encourage us to really think about the ideas of um, not only explicit bias, which we certainly still witness um, in healthcare, um, but implicit bias, which is often, of course, unconscious inherently. And then microaggressions, which is something that we've really started to study more in healthcare. And I'm, I'm really glad we have because um, most of them occur unconsciously. And generally they can also even happen commonly in those who want to be providing positive affirming care. Um, but bias in and of itself is something that I encourage people to think of as not always inherently negative because it's part of evolutionary and environmental adaption that we actually have biases. And some biases protect us based on our experiences. But of course, what can happen is in our society when we have biases um, related to minority groups or whatever um, those different things might be, um, because they are very common based, unfortunately, on our societal norms, what we've seen and heard perhaps in our own youth or on TV or wherever it might have been that we all, I think, at some point have seen examples of bias toward sexual and gender minorities, then that can become something that we take in and we think of differently unconsciously. That doesn't make us bad individuals. That makes us people who have been in a society that has shaped us and that we have evolved in and situations. And so I, first of all, like for people just to remember that bias can lead to negative outcomes. But when we try to be aware of our bias and realize that 
we can change our thoughts, but we may be doing things not even realizing it, that to me gives us a new power. Um, and by taking away um, perhaps a self-negativity, thinking, well, I can't believe I would treat someone differently, for example, I would never do that. But maybe you are doing that without meaning to. So things that we've already talked about that can actually come forward as microaggressions are things like assumptions, assuming heteronormativity, not asking, assuming um, cisnormativity, um, stereotypes, um, portraying LGBTQ identities as abnormal. While you're talking in the nurse's station, um, I also in one of our studies had someone say, I'm afraid for my colleagues to find out I'm bisexual. I hear how my nurse colleagues talk about people. You know, so there's some of these things that just once again show how just the smallest comment um, can actually um, hurt patient outcomes or even make it more difficult for a colleague who may have that identity and may then feel uncomfortable. So I just bring those things up because that's a very heavy topic, a difficult topic, one that can take a lot of work over a lot of time. So um, that's really the very tip of the iceberg. But I do think that it is essential that we think along those lines as healthcare providers to really start to affect change. Because as long as we aren't willing to acknowledge our role, then unfortunately, these inherent biases, microaggressions, which then lead to unfortunately negative outcomes or even our patients who identify as LGBTQ not even wanting, being afraid to even seek health care, those things will persist. Thank you so much. And thank you for touching on um, the importance of being aware of our biases and how that not only affects LGBTQ patients, but also LGBTQ nurses themselves. So I know we talked a little bit about, um, or you all mentioned a little bit about the importance of collecting information like sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, are there any other patient demographics that you could think of that would be important to um, effectively serve the LGBTQ community within healthcare? Well, one really important one that just is right there at the front of my mind is that often um, who someone's family or support or the people that are important in their lives are is not something we ask, or we may make assumptions about that. And that's something that, um, can then become a challenge when we don't know who is the is or are people that are important in that individual's life or who would they want to be with them at a visit or not. And those kind of things are every bit as important as asking um, to someone who is heterosexual, but sometimes we either get uncomfortable or make assumptions about that. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Uh, I think that's another piece of that cultural competency, understanding that people in our community, uh, we have chosen families, you know, that are, you know, just as important, if not more for a lot of folks um, than those families that they're born into. So I think that's really important. You know, I, when it comes to intake forms um, and making them as inclusive as possible, I think it's important to ask pronouns always, um, patients, um, the name they go by. So it may be different than their legal names. We always ask sex, sex assigned at birth, um, I think those are all important questions, uh, especially um, from a provider standpoint, to make sure that you, you know, have all the information to treat the whole patient. Thank you. And another thing that is um, very important is I, I see two things happen sometimes. I see either this um, insistence of obtaining a great deal of sexual information somehow simply because of someone's identity, um, or this just a lack of asking any questions. Um, so I think it is um, asking the appropriate questions to the visit, um, but instead of doing what we might always call a review of systems, for example, with reproduction, we need to be doing an organ inventory. What do you have? What are your body parts that we need to take care of? Um, that is something that anyone um, can answer, hopefully, um, without it being, um, any more uncomfortable than it has to be. Um, also, 
um, asking about at the appropriate time, sexual practices or behaviors, because it amazes me how based on someone's identity, um, we somehow jump to these assumptions that that means they are doing this with this body part. They might be, they may be doing something totally different. Um, and if you don't ask, you really are not going to be giving them the correct care. And it is, um, very interesting to me, and really that also goes for all of our patients, that is neither of those things should only be asked of our LGBTQ patients, but um, interestingly, um, we like to make these assumptions once again, rather than asking those questions um, when, was that it's the appropriate visit to do so, um, if we're doing a visit perhaps that's a, a wellness visit or um, something of that nature. Yeah, and to kind of touch on that as well, those are such those are amazing points. Kind of an example of this in the in the real world too is um, when it comes to prep. Prep is only being used by about twenty five percent of the people who would benefit from it, and providers are not asking or not offering prep to people other than men who have sex with men. That is like the biggest group that people are being offered, and it it can help everyone. Um, and so that's where you see that bias and that not asking those sexual health uh, history questions um, play out where people could benefit from something and our biases are like, oh, well, this, if this is the way they identify, this means this medicine's the, for them and not everybody else. So, so um, can you kind of give a short a little snippet, Bridget, of what PrEP is for everybody? So PrEP is a pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, and it is 99% effective at preventing HIV. Um, it's an amazing medication that we have that's really underutilized. Um, it should be prescribed and offered in primary care. A lot of times it's not being. Um, and like I said before, it's not being offered to everyone that could benefit from it. And so um, it is fantastic. And I hope that, um, that you're receiving education on it. It's one of... I think um, before I became a provider and then folks that I talked with, it was a very scary, um, you know, again, very mystified medication. And it, those are my easiest visits. Those are my most, I feel like, rewarding visits because you really get to talk with folks um, and help them understand the prevention piece. It, it, it empowers them. It's really, again, putting that power in their hands, right? And they um, can choose to protect themselves. And like the video was talking about, we we talk about risk a lot in healthcare and we assume certain groups are at higher risk and, um, you know, that's not the case. And so let people empower themselves, let them have those tools um, to protect themselves in that way. So. All right. So thank you all so much for answering those questions. It's amazing that we get to share this information with nurses all across Kentucky today. Um, but I think we're gonna go now to questions from people um, in the audience. So we're gonna start with this question is something I believe Chris could maybe answer. Um, Melissa asks, what is the underlying fear driving the congressional bills? Oh, there's so much to unpack there. So the, the bills in the state legislature right now are largely being driven by uh, some major national conservative interest groups, particularly the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, and this is something that we've seen over the past several years. I, I mean, I'll give you the, the real truncated history that after we won the right to marry at the Supreme Court in 2015, our opposition felt that they had had the rug pulled out from under them. You know, in countless political campaigns, conservatives were always using, I preserve the right to marry. And now they no longer had that as a political wedge issue. So opponents started scrambling in 2015 and did focus group testing and did polling and figured out that most people were still unfamiliar with transgender folks. And so they pivoted first to prevent trans folks from using the bathroom. And that didn't stick. Uh, we were actually the first state to face a bathroom bill in 2015. We defeated it. Uh, but then immediately thereafter, North Carolina had their bathroom bill and they had a huge fallout from major sports uh, events to concerts, all sorts of opposition, corporate, tourism to 
North Carolina's bathroom bill. So that didn't work. So then they pivoted to uh, sports, trans access in sports, and that stuck. Uh, and so based on the polling, they kept on down that road. And the next thing was gender affirming health care. You know, this isn't a, a homegrown issue that I keep reminding folks last week in the House Judiciary Committee, um, the folks that testified in favor of the anti-trans health care bill were from out of state. They, they brought them in by Zoom. You know, we had 30 people sign up to testify against the bill. They had four people and three of them were from out of state. Uh, and so, you know, it is because not enough people have trans family members that they know of, um, that they have gone through the journey of understanding and acceptance and support. And that's what it's gonna take to start sort of um, taking away the stigma of the other. From, from our trans folks. Uh, and so the other side just preys on that fear, that misinformation, and utilizes it, again, really just to put it on their political postcard uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, what they will say, though, you know, the arguments that they'll use um, is that uh, they say that 80 to 90 percent of trans folks, trans kids, if they're allowed to go through puberty, will somehow decide that they are not trans uh, at the end of that. And we know that that is absolutely not not true. Um, but, you know, that is what the other side peddles. They've never peddled in the truth, unfortunately. Uh, and so they use this min misinformation and they fly around the country a few folks um, who have uh, detransitioned, uh, and they exploit those folks' personal narratives uh, to, to try to build support for their cause. I should also mention very briefly, since we talked about uh, PrEP and HIV prevention, um, that we do have a really great bill that's running right now. I haven't added it to the Fairness website yet because we've been a little quiet about it because we want it to pass. But House Bill 349 is a bill that would decriminalize people living uh, with HIV in several ways. We've got some outdated HIV laws on the books still in Kentucky. Uh, it is a class D felony right now. If you're a person living with HIV uh, and you try to donate a, uh, an organ or other tissue to somebody else living with HIV, and yet the federal law changed 10 years ago to say that people living with HIV can donate organs and tissue to other people living with HIV. So House Bill 349, which made it out of the Health Committee last week in the House and is on the consent calendar tomorrow, very good sign, would uh, take away that felony. It's also, believe it or not, it is a class C felony in Kentucky today to distribute home HIV tests for free. Now, mind you, you can go to Walgreens and Walmart, you buy uh, an Aura Sure test or an Aura Quick test, and it's going to cost you 50 or 60 bucks, but you can buy it off the shelf. But it's a felony if a nonprofit or a healthcare organization distributes those tests for free. Uh, and that's an outdated statute from 1990. So House Bill 349 would also um, eliminate that felony statute as well. All right. Becky had a question and said, I had a patient whose sexual orientation was asked and was subsequently used to discriminate against him. That was really concerning to me. And how do we prevent that? Well, I don't think there is a perfect answer for that because that is the challenge when we don't work on the healthcare provider side. Um, I think, um, as with anything in healthcare, it takes um, the ability to advocate for your patient. That doesn't mean that you can prevent all harm, unfortunately, um, because we all have seen these things happen. But I, I think that it is also talking with that patient as an individual, um, you know, um, even on, on a personal level, if you witnessed or know something has happened, um, as appropriate that should go higher up the chain in your um, organization. If there has been a problem, nearly all the healthcare organizations in our area have non-discrimination policies, which means that um, a healthcare provider or staff member would be in violation of that policy. Um, if it's something that is, for example, one of the microaggressions that may 
certainly be hurtful, but perhaps unintentional, I think that can be a time for you to have that conversation with your coworker one-on-one. I heard you say such and such. Um, When I heard that, it made me feel this way or um, kind of taking that on and sharing if it seems perhaps that it was unintentional. So this is is one of the frightening things that can happen and is also certainly one of the reasons that um, individuals are afraid to um, identify their sexual orientation and gender identity is because it has been historically used against individuals and it still is often. And they also, if they've not experienced it, unfortunately, we know they have heard the stories. We have all heard the story. So they have that well-founded, often unfortunate fear, even if they've not experienced it, that this um, may be a result of doing that. So I wish there was a perfect answer for that, but those are just some of um, my thoughts, which kind of go back to um, any time, I guess, when we would have a concern related to patient care, Um, kind of following those same type of principles, even though this is um, perhaps different than a medication error, almost viewing it as the same type of thing. Now, what would we do? Um, What should I do to follow the appropriate thing based on what has occurred, based on my agency's um, recommendations, et cetera? Yeah, I agree completely. And also, I think knowing the history uh, of, you know, discrimination um, in healthcare for LGBTQ folks, having more compassion with, with patients and, and those that you meet um, in your healthcare journey and understanding that, you know, even if you ask, people may not come out the first time they meet you because it's scary, even for me. I mean, I had to do a, a virtual um, urgent care appointment the other day and, um, you know, I was scared. I'm like, I don't know how this person is going to treat me. I don't know who they are. Um, and so just having that compassion with people and, and continuing to ask, um, but knowing that it takes people time, you have to build rapport um, and that's okay. So if somebody doesn't come out to you the first time um, and, you know, disclose that information, um, but the more you talk, the more comfortable people become with you, um, the more likely they will. I want to share very briefly, if someone's using uh, someone's sexual orientation or gender identity to discriminate against a patient, it's not only a violation of policy at virtually every hospital uh, around, in the 24 places where we have local fairness ordinances in in Kentucky, it is a violation of the law. Uh, If they are discriminating uh, in Louisville, Lexington, Covington, or those 21 other places, which you can find on the map at fairness.org, which I just dropped in the chat, you can file a complaint either with the local human rights commission or in some of the smaller cities, it would be with the city manager or the city administrator, and they will absolutely investigate that. Uh, If someone doesn't feel comfortable sort of being on the record and coming forward, um, uh, they can just sort of anonymously tip off the the local investigatory agency and and they will do an investigation uh, to to be certain that that type of discrimination doesn't persist in in that workplace. All right, we'll probably do one or two more questions. Um, run out of time. So Charlotte said something that stuck out to me in the documentary was the need for people to not lose steam. With the bills coming out of Kentucky, we cannot afford to. Do you have ideas for how we can rally our coworkers, providers, admin, et cetera, to be accomplices when people in our world are already feeling burned out? Well, I just can't tell you how important it is to have medical professionals make their voices heard. If all you have time to do is to send that email that I dropped in or uh, on uh, on the website, it also tells you to call the message line It may seem like such a small thing, you know, like, oh, I'm sure they're getting all sorts of messages. I, I, you know, not enough people contact their state representative and their state senator. Let me be clear. You probably know who your state senator or state rep is. You may not know they're your state senator or state rep, but these are folks that you'll run into at the grocery store. These are very accessible people. Uh, And so making a connection with them and letting them know that you have expertise in this field and that you're offering, you know, your expertise and your knowledge to them on this issue 
is incredibly important. Uh, and aside from that, you know, rallying, and this is the real challenge, getting your hospital to take a position, getting your associations to take a public position, and you all as the grassroots membership of these places are the ones who can move them to do it. And again, it's, it's not easy. Um, sometimes it feels like moving mountains, but it is so necessary and important. Uh, Dr. Chris Bowling uh, in uh, the House Judiciary Committee last week uh, represented the Kentucky Medical Association. And that was huge to have someone on the record from KMA saying we as an organization, an association of medical professionals, absolutely oppose this type of harmful legislation because we know that it leads to more deaths uh, for Kentucky's kids. Th those sorts of things are, are so important. Um, and, you know, no action is too small. We've seen this grassroots movement of all these high schools across Kentucky and some middle schools too, walking out to protest these anti-LGBTQ bills. Um, you know, any action is, is an important one as we, we build this wave of opposition against these harmful bills. Um, so before we end, I might say your name wrong. I'm sorry. Is it Nisia? Nisia, um, I know you wanted to speak earlier and we weren't able to hear you. Um, did you still want to talk? Sorry, <laughs> I was driving um, from work to home. Um, I just wanted to uh, direct the folks attending this night to the things I put in the chat. Um, I don't want to take up more time with all of that. I was just describing some of the ways I've been involved um, as healthcare professional, as a nurse, also as a Kentuckian um, for LGBTQ plus healthcare access. I've had the great honor and pleasure of doing some collaboration with Chris Hartman of uh, Fairness, who just gave you such an excellent picture of the bills that are in play in Frankfurt. Um, and I have represented myself both as a Kentucky nurse um, and as a person who's been intimately um, involved in this concern, having been married for 28 years to a person who was assigned female at birth and is a transmasculine person. Um, I, I have many resources and also connections if anyone on this call would be interested in pursuing this in any way. I wanted to thank the um, two panelists. I'm sorry I wasn't able to hear everything they had to say because I was driving. Um, thank you so much, um, just everyone for uh, being present in this evening. Um, it's, it's terribly, it's tearing and it's terribly frustrating to hear arguments put forward like freedom and liberty and parental rights and that the state has a compelling interest as was said last week in Frankfurt, the state has a compelling interest in entering into people's homes and families to police um, their care of their own children. It's, it's so contradictory because the same folks would tell you that they um, deserve the liberty to remove books from school's curriculum, for instance, or to prosecute, prosecute any healthcare provider who would attempt to offer um, any kind of gender affirming services. Um, but it is like one of the people said in the chat, it's like, keep on keeping on. There's so many people that can help support us. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, Trevor, can I add, Nisia, those conferences you put in are fantastic. So Nisia put in the chat mm -hmm. the um, two conferences from Fenway Health. Um, they partner with Harvard. Um, it's mm -hmm. usually two a year, um, one on advancing excellence in sexual and gender minority health, and then another on advancing trans health. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say this. If you, uh, I know conferences can be incredibly expensive, um, but if you identify as LGBT, um, a lot of the times, if you go to the website, they have scholarships to those conferences. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. don't forget to look for that. They're fantastic. Um, when I was in my um, FMP program, um, you know, money is tight and I was able to do one of the scholarships for those. So look into those conferences. They're great. Thank you. All right. So I think we're right at the end. So thank you everyone for being here again. Um, the professional nursing practice and advocacy cabinet worked really hard to make this happen. And I'm so happy that 
We did. Um, so, and thank you to Bridget, Dr. Alshire, and Chris for being here today. I know you all took times out of your busy schedules to be here with us and um, answer our questions so amazingly. So, um, with that being said, is there anything you would like to add, Delanor, Dolores, or anyone else? Hello. Um, I just want to thank everybody so much for being here tonight for the KNA um, Social Justice Movie Night. These events have been amazing to bring forward awareness of disparities and bias and inequities in healthcare. And tonight, just continue that discussion with the LGBTQ community. So, thank you so much to the Professional Nursing Practice and Advocacy Cabinet. They worked so hard, as Trevor said, worked very, very hard to find this video and bring together the expert panelists. Speaking of which, panelists, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience and your expertise and your knowledge. It truly was a wonderful evening. And um, again, to the cabinet, thank you for your hard work. You made tonight phenomenal, truly. And then I just want to leave you all with a few dates to mark your calendar. The KA Legislative Conference is on May 26th. So hopefully you'll be able to make that. That's going to be continued advocacy and professional development and learning and networking. And then May is Nurses Month. So there'll be much more information coming for that. And we have our fall conference on the 3rd of November, which the theme for that is there is no healthcare without nurses, all nurses are leaders. So I just wanna thank everybody again for tonight. It was truly a phenomenal evening. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank you.